Thanks for tuning in to another installment of Advanced TV Herstory, a podcast that studies, analyzes, and celebrates women's roles throughout the history of television. Among thousands of comedies and dramas that have aired, strong women characters are still in short supply and hold valuable lessons for all of us. In some cases, good shows or characters of today can be traced to an influence that aired 20, 30, even 40 years ago, with an eye to aligning the leadership lesson, time capsule observation, or some fascinating backstory of a show's success or failure, my goal of advanced TV history is to connect the treasures of the past to the great potential of today's TV and online productions. Theme songs that prompt a smile, characters that make you want to stand a little taller, shows that defy social norms or expectations of how good women should behave, it's all here in advanced TV history. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Where would women in TV be today without that strong backbone genre of Our Lady Detectives? Today we're going to look at Nancy Drew and her enigmatic mystery. You know, the one of why the TV show from 1977 to 1979 was so bad, so forgettable. Because 50-some Nancy Drew mystery books were written before the advent and availability of TV, our favorite girl sleuth set the stage for so many memorable characters, like Pepper Anderson of Policewoman, Christine Cagney and Mary Beth Lacey of Cagney and Lacey, and Murder, She Wrote's Jessica Fletcher, not to mention our modern-day Veronica Mars. We'll explore what went wrong with the Nancy Drew mysteries by looking at these factors. A main legendary character who did not transfer well to the screen. We'll look at writing and plot development that should have caused the writers to be fired. And finally, a poorly timed entry into a TV environment that celebrated women's independence, risk-taking, and intelligence. So really, why didn't a character as well-developed as the inimitable, beloved Nancy Drew come alive? Well, compared with Hardy Boys plots, Nancy Drew episodes were, in a word, painful. They were overly simplistic and didn't relate at all to its target audience, teen girls. It was that criticism that prompted star Pamela Sue Martin to quit the show in the middle of season two. She was replaced for the show's final three episodes by Janet Louise Johnson, though Martin got the last word of sorts by posing for Playboy magazine trench coat and fedora in hand, and um, revealing her uh, story. Yeah. Sure, the Hardy Boys, those stars Parker Stevenson and Sean Cassidy with their feathered hair, measured hot on the heartthrob meter of 1977. Nancy Drew's target audience, 13-year-old girls, 12-year-old girls, wasn't exactly fluent, however, in critical thinking as feminists. Some may have wanted to match wits with Nancy Drew and maybe had their moms beside them on the couch. Others only tuned in to see Sean Cassidy, tight pants and all, and this week's edition of Tiger Beat come alive on the small screen. He got to sing in many, many episodes. And as such, the Hardy Boys were renewed for a third season, but Nancy Drew was dropped at two. So the limits that Pamela Sue Martin refers to with regard to the Nancy Drew mysteries, well, it's difficult for the Nancy Drew mysteries to fit into a timeline of the development of strong women's roles in TV. It's just disappointing because a title character series with great content DNA from well-known book plots feels like it never made it out of the gate. So in that respect, it suffered, almost to a T, the same fate as the movies from the late 30s, which starred Bonita Granville as Nancy. And the backstory of the women and man behind the collection of books is its own drama. So we can wring our hands about how Nancy has never been successfully brought to the screen, but what does that get us? Instead, it's important to understand that Nancy the brand and the series as franchise was nursed and nurtured through the years. Read Melanie Reack's 2005 history of this publishing legend entitled Girl Sleuth, Nancy Drew and the Women Who Created Her. It's published by Harcourt. In her book, author Melanie Rehack tells the grand story of the series' origins, the syndicate of ghostwriters who consistently churned out content and were paid per manuscript. To be a writer for the Stratemeyer Syndicate, which was perhaps the most successful one ever, meant that a writer like Mildred Augustine Wirt waived any credit or public rights of authorship, as well as compensation that was only limited to the per-manuscript fee. She received no royalties. And who knew what a cash cow the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys series would go on to become, reigning for more than 50 years, spanning the middle of the 20th century? 
But contained within that whole Nancy Drew brand was a set of parameters that emerged early on from the 30s by her founders. For instance, Nancy Drew would never marry. She would never get involved in a serious romantic relationship. Her plots would lack a strong mother figure in order to feature her problem solving more prominently. And last but not least, she would never be faced with money worries. These parameters make it very difficult to transfer to a real live on-screen version of Nancy Drew. So in 1938, when Warner Brothers purchased the Nancy Drew movie rights from the Stratemeyer Syndicate, Bonita Granville starred in the film, and it was entitled Nancy Drew Detective. As you can imagine, critics paid close attention to the transfer of this hot property to the silver screen, and they found flaws. The films never matched the book series' popularity. So Rehack, in her book, writes, In general, everyone talks down to Nancy in the movie. And amazingly, that same criticism could be made of characters in the TV series. Given the brand parameters, it just proved too difficult to fast forward, forward Nancy 40 years and parachute her into the mid-1970s. In the book's time period that precedes Title IX, the ERA, and Vietnam, Nancy Drew's self-confidence was developed from within, not from society. And that's a powerful message that should not be lost on today's young woman or TV showrunner. It has to be a great challenge to depict that confidence within, celebrated and understood by every reader, onto the screen. So maybe that's why the character never succeeded beyond the limits of our imaginations. In hindsight, maybe Nancy should have stayed frozen in time in the 1930s as a period series set in the 30s with all the attendant plots, fashion, cars, and visuals, similar to how the Wonder Woman series, starring Linda Carter, was set in World War II. Ingredient for failure number two. It takes pretty bad writers and producers to develop inane plots and dialogue, particularly when they were delivered the Nancy Drew adventures on a silver platter. The popularity and expanse of the book series drove great expectation when the show aired from 1977 to 1979. The much anticipated show disappointed in many ways, so much so that it prompted the star emerging actress Pamela Sue Martin to quit the show. Let's review the details. The year was 1977. If you were a girl looking for a TV show you could relate to that wasn't a Western or about war or a male homicide detective, then you probably waited patiently each week for the Hardy Boys Nancy Drew mysteries to come on. But for girls looking for exploits of their peer, Nancy Drew, they had to wait patiently perhaps another week. For while the shows were billed as parody, the Hardy Boys Nancy Drew mysteries, there really were about two-thirds Hardy Boys episodes, and the remaining shows were either Nancy Drew shows or featured all three of them together. So in season two, they met for the first time in Paris and traveled to Transylvania to find Mr. Hardy. But this is an example where a two-part segment was billed as a Hardy Boys mystery with Pamela Sue Martin guest starring as Nancy Drew. Created well into the modern women's movement, this Nancy Drew TV series should have been the logical springboard to the 21st century peer of Veronica Mars. Now, the Veronica Mars series was never premised on any other literature, or at least nothing as nearly popular as the Nancy Drew series was for so many years. But lo and behold, the Veronica Mars people do pay homage to Nancy. Nancy Drew's name comes up every once in a while in Veronica's dialogue, even parenthetically. Time for a chat? Well, I think if hell froze over, maybe it'd be on the news. I just want to hear more about the steroids you bought last weekend. You mean the steroids Luke bought? Wow, you suck at this Nancy Drew stuff. You should get a new hobby. So you knew he was doing it. You actually think that I would tell you anything? Hmm. I guess we're done here, officer. Sup, T. Nancy Drew in all her books and Veronica Mars in her three seasons on TV certainly hold their own as teen detectives against a host of bad guys in dangerous situations. Let's face it, they're forces of good. They're positive. They're polite. That's why it's so frustrating that the renowned, respected, and popular Nancy Drew series never got the fighting chance. One look at Nancy Drew Season 2 plot summaries 
reveals a certain lightness in plot and setting. The first was Nancy crossing paths with an old high school classmate, played by Maureen McCormick. Hmm, Maureen McCormick. Oh, oh yes! Marsha, Marsha, Marsha of the Brady Bunch. In this episode, Maureen McCormick plays an emerging tennis star who is known by her father and coach to be a kleptomaniac. Nancy ends up shadowing Maureen at Maureen's father's request to keep her out of trouble and to return any stolen goods. And this is why I don't read fiction. Nancy's initial cover is blown right out of the gate. Undercover as a sports writer, Nancy was supposed to hang out at the Las Vegas Hotel and track the tennis tournament in which Maureen McCormick's character was a player. But Nancy is introduced to a man who just happens to claim to know pretty much every sports writer in the market and who's staying at the hotel. So when she's asked the reason of her Las Vegas stay, she fudges a bit and she makes up that she's the girlfriend of tennis player Sandy Castelli. The plot of Nancy Drew's love match, yes, yes, that's the title, never really gets off the ground. The mystery draws to a close, and the guy, originally hired to track Maureen's character, is revealed to be a thief as well. Imagine the lessons a gullible teenage girl of the day might read into this epilogue. Maureen confesses that while she won the tennis trophy, she also has a problem. Kleptomania. Nope, a woman character can't just walk away a winner. There has to be something wrong with her. The authorities give Nancy modest credit for unraveling all the details. But just as they are celebrating the tennis tournament win, tennis player Sandy Castelli approaches Nancy and asks her out to dinner. Oh yes, we giddily shift from Nancy's skills as a sleuth to her needing to prepare to dine with an older man. Isn't the dinner date really what's more important? The second plot from the second season, and I won't go any further because I think we're all smart enough to see a trend here, is the episode called Will the Real Santa Claus? Rick Springfield is a heartthrob guest star in this episode, and the clip I'm about to play is part of a scene in a barn where Nancy takes on the bad guy, and Rick it makes it clear that he's been looking out for Nancy, and um, yeah, here it is. You should have read this morning's newspaper, Mr. Cortez. You'd have read that they arrested someone else as the Christmas thief. And they found your bag of silver. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I think you do. A stable can be a dangerous place. A horse can kick you right in the head. You know what I mean? So far, the police can only book you on robbery because you haven't hurt anybody yet. I don't think I'd be so stupid as to come here without calling the police first. They'll be here any second. They're on their I way. I really should have taken care of you last night. <laughs> All right, get him out of here. I have a fingerprint I lifted from a doorknob at the Garlands. I'm sure it's going to match Mr. Cortez's. Well, we'll get our forensic boys right over to your house. Can I take you home, Nancy? That's all right. I'll take care. How did you become cavalry? Your girlfriend told me what you were doing. I didn't like the sound of it. I thought I'd check it out. I didn't want to look like an amateur. What was that for? It was for saving my life. I'm going to have to do that more often. You know something? You're really not so bad after all. <laughs> I gotta hand it to you. You said you'd prove Griffin was innocent. Even if you didn't prove he was Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's Thing is, by 1978, female detectives were not being saved by would-be boyfriends who just happened to be lingering. That held true in the days of the Mod Squad, which appeared from 1968 to 1973, and positioned young Julie Barnes, played by Peggy Lipton, alongside handsome hunks Link Hayes, played by Clarence Williams III, and Michael Cole's character Pete Cochran. In the late 1960s TV and into the early 70s, a woman in danger was likely to needed to be saved by a man. When did that change? Oh, in about 1976 when a trio of trained police officers turned private detectives emerged on the scene. 
Jill Monroe could count on Sabrina Duncan and Kelly Garrett to have her backside. And Charlie's Angels demonstrated that in numbers, women can watch out for each other. As the saying goes, there's no I in team, but in the case of Charlie's Angels, there's always good hair. Okay, I digress. Back to Rick Springfield saving Nancy's life in the clip. Well, really he didn't because the police were about five seconds behind him. But seriously, did the Nancy Drew production team bother to read the trade magazines or watch a few of the shows that were consistently in the top ten or do anything to realize that this was so far askew from what real young women were experiencing and expecting? I don't consider the series a particular achievement. Obviously, it has certain limitations. Nancy Drew never cried or experienced an inordinate amount of pain. There was never any tragedy or extreme emotion, never a kissing scene or any sign that she would indulge with the opposite sex, Pamela Sue Martin went on to recall. A big moment for her was coming across an old skeleton in a dungeon and screaming, or being attacked by a bat in Transylvania. Some of it was so bad I found myself cringing. End quote. Pamela Sue Martin, Playboy Magazine, 1978. But for all its shortcomings, it's still worth watching if you ever get a chance. And here's why. A few of the most redeeming points to the show come in the form of Nancy Drew herself. Remember in the books how she drove a blue convertible? Well, true to form, TV Nancy drives a light blue Mustang. No, it's not a convertible, but it's pretty snappy. Yeah, girls and moms were probably traumatized by the plots as much as Pamela Sue Martin was. But the wardrobe and the hair is a fashion time capsule. No doubt the best part of watching the DVDs today. Nancy had an outfit for every occasion and really looked the part of a professional woman of the day, even one who is 23 years old. There was a preponderance of receding hairlines, comb-overs, and toupees. Really, were these characters supposed to be this simplistic? Or was this just B-grade creep talent from Central Casting? Maybe, just maybe, some sick writer thought it was important to subvert the emerging power of womanhood with a reminder of who really controls things in real life. What is this, a meritocracy? Look for clues and be prepared? Poise from a young woman who can achieve the goal without ever having to raise her voice? Ha! We must stop that girl before she's on to us. Or maybe the writers weren't really that smart, smart enough to embed a subliminal message into the script. They were just sexist and scared. One wonderful contrast to those jokers, though, was Nancy's dad, Mr. Carson Drew. Mr. Drew was an attorney who relied on Nancy to investigate for his cases and was played by the wonderful William Shallert. Nancy's relationship with her father was grounded in respect, and he treated her like an adult. Did you find out what's missing yet? Oh, uh, yeah. I'll tell you later, hon, after my double vision goes. Hi, George. I'm sorry, Mr. Drew. I really didn't... <laughs> Stop. Listen, uh, the main thing is that the two of you are okay. You know, I, I think you're very fortunate young ladies. And I'll, uh, I'll find out what's missing after I've gone through all of these files and folders. There seem to be several files missing. Hmm, that's odd. Well, now that's a nuisance. What's a nuisance? Well, I can't find the folder on the sale of Aunt Ruby and Aunt Leela's farm. It has no intrinsic value. Now I'll have to go up to the Capitol and get the sale documents replaced. Well, I thought that sale was all wrapped up. Well, not until we close escrow tomorrow. We can't do that without those papers. You'll have to call Aunt Ruby and tell her. I don't envy you that. If that voice and calm demeanor seems familiar, it's because William Schaller, from his role as Martin Lane, who, Patty's dad and Kathy's uncle on the Patty Duke show, is a very memorable voice. Love, love, love William Schaller. In addition to his father duties on Patty Duke, he was dad to the new Gidget in a TV show by the same name, which aired from 1986 to 1988. Schallert just seemed to be the kind of dad who had the good sense to let his daughter be herself and to test her limits. The third ingredient in this sad story will just title Nancy Drew and the Love-Hate Relationship with the Women's Movement. Some say that Nancy's power for the reader is founded in the reader's imagination. 
Everyone has a different idea of what she looks like, how she sounds, and perhaps with an uncanny resemblance to the reader herself. No wonder she can never make it for real on the screen. We could devote hours to the postmortem of the TV show, and in her book, Melanie Rehack asserts, maybe it just couldn't compete alongside Charlie's Angels. Even the tamer Mary Tyler Moore was bringing her own 30-minute show to a close by then. Women were evolving at such a tremendous pace, and the Nancy Drew brand, five decades in the making, presented a thick cloak. It just seems nearly impossible, thinking back to that year, to have come up with a series that would have done justice to the Nancy Drew that your mom and grandma read faithfully in the books, who could also hold her own in the windswept 70s. Yet in the absence of Nancy Drew, do we ever get Jessica Fletcher? Even for women and men who never read a single chapter, Nancy Drew, the girl sleuth, is a shared American experience. She embraced her own confidence and belief in right and wrong. She set a high bar for our fictional TV detectives and their imaginative creators who followed. Maybe it's a good thing the show is nearly forgotten. And here's my postscript that serves as a reminder of the kind of pride and hard work that went into the Nancy Drew series. In a catfight worthy of Fallon Carrington Colby, the show's run opened the old question of the identity of Nancy's creator. Okay, a step back. For listeners too young to recognize that name, Pamela Sue Martin's next and last big role came in Dynasty, playing the role of Fallon Carrington Colby. She was saucy and she was sassy. So, remember the code of silence those confidentiality agreements that the Stratemeyer Syndicate forced its writers to sign? Well, upon the t TV show's resurrection, the Nancy Drew series success story again caught America's interest. Syndicate President Harriet Adams, who had been the reigning president for 50 or more years, claimed sole credit so boldly that you'd think she was practically writing the first outlines, which really were the work of her father, from her old high school desk. Not to be silenced by a woman who so did not deserve such credit, Mildred Augustine Wirt, the real author, crawled out from behind her confidentiality agreements and late in life was celebrated for her years of writing this series and others. Lawsuits? Pride? Who revealed what in decades-old correspondence? Harriet and Mildred were very tough ladies and together they lived a story that in itself is worth a shot at the silver or small screen. And I can see that yellow suits, big shoulder pads, big hair, mud, this really should have been a plot, a great plot, for Dynasty. So that's it. Look at how the brand, known as the Nancy Drew Mysteries, and the controls placed on such hugely popular fictional works hamstrung the franchise from making it big on both the silver screen and, more importantly, on TV. But its impact will be felt for a long time to come. For more information about Melanie Rehack's book, Girl Sleuth, Nancy Drew and the Women Who Created Her, go to her website at Melanie Rehack, and her last name is spelled R-E-H-A-K dot com. And Pamela Sue Martin has archived that 1978 Playboy interview and a few photos on her website at PamelaSueMartin.net. Thanks for listening. I'm Cynthia Amos Amos.